An uninterrupted series of satellites has collected sea level measurements for nearly 30 years. And now a joint U.S.-European effort will launch the next spacecraft to carry on this legacy of monitoring sea surface height. We are here today to count down the launch of the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite that is less than a month away and answer your questions later in the briefing. This has been a true collaboration among several agencies, which you will see represented today. In a first joint Earth mission involving NASA and the European Space Agency, this sea level scout will collect the most accurate data yet on sea level and how it changes over time. This is this big complex machine that we're trying to understand. We really need to understand how it's changing. How is it evolving? Wherever you live on this globe, the oceans will influence you in some form or the other. We are answering those really interesting and hard questions that we all have about our universe and our planet. And my name is Severine Fournier, and I'm observing our changing oceans from space. I'm Shannon Statham, and here at NASA JPL, I help prepare Sentinel-6 for its journey to space. My name is Shailen Desai. My name is Parag Baze. My name is Ben Hamilton, and I'm studying sea level rise from space. We're looking at a one-third replica of the Sentinel-6 microfrylic satellite. Sentinel-6 is all about water. This sort of top half of the satellite houses the main instruments. We have the altimeter, we have the radiometer. Sentinel-6 is a collaboration with NASA, NOAA, the European Space Agency, and, and also UMITSAT in Europe to measure sea level. And it's specifically capturing the height of the ocean. The satellite is actually emitting a, a signal. And that signal is bouncing back. It measures the time it takes for that pulse to get back. So we've been measuring the height of the ocean since the beginning of the 90s. I've worked on Topex Poseidon, Jason 1, Jason 2, Jason 3. We really need that long duration observation and Sentinel-6 is going to allow us to continue that record so that we can better predict what is the rate of change, what is it going to look like in a year, five years, ten years from now and so forth. It's not just scientific curiosity, it really impacts the daily lives of people and their ability to plan for their future. I see pictures of coastal inundation and flooding. You start to realize the importance of understanding what sea level is doing now. We can use that understanding to know what sea level might be doing in the future. Seeing that come to fruition is a personal satisfaction and an emotional satisfaction. Scientists around the world are using these data to help people. The importance of this project and where it touches is on all walks of life all across the world. From space, it's just one planet. Welcome, I am Marina Jureka from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. I am your host today as we bring you a closer look at this incredible mission that will continue to help us understand how our oceans are changing. As we are social distancing, I will introduce you virtually to some of the people behind the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite. We are experiencing a bit of an audio delay with our European partners, so please be patient with us. On our panel, today we have NASA's Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, Thomas Zerbuchen, who will talk about NASA's dedication to Earth observations and the legacy of Michael Freilich, whom the satellite was named after. The European Commission's Deputy Director General for Space, Pierre Delso, who will speak about the legacy and commitment to Earth science missions through the years. European Space Agency's Director of Earth Observation, Joseph Oshbacher, will will tell us about the agency's Copernicus program, the European Union's Earth Observation program, which monitors our planet and its environment for the ultimate benefit of its people. NASA's Earth Science Division Director, Karen St. Germain, will discuss the benefit to humanity in understanding and studying the Earth and the importance of what Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich will show us. Director General Alain Ratier of the European Organization for the Exploration of Meteorological satellites or UMETSAT who can talk about how this organization will carry on day-to-day -day operations of science gathering for the satellite. Project manager for this mission Parag Vaze of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory will talk about the legacy of these Earth observing satellites starting with Topex Poseidon almost 
30 years ago. NASA's program scientist for this mission is Nadia Vinogradova Schiffer, who will break down the science goals and what the mission hopes to accomplish moving forward. And finally, Tim Dunn, the NASA launch director for Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich, who will give us an update on launch status as we count down to November 10th. For anyone watching who would like to submit a question, you can do so by using the Seeing the Seas hashtag. Our phone lines are now open to the media. You can ask a question by pressing star one to be put into the queue. We will begin with NASA's Associate Administrator, Thomas Zerbukin, at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Dr. Z, welcome. This project has been such an incredible international collaboration, which is appropriate since all the oceans unite us all. Thank you, Marina. Indeed. We live on a blue marble flying through space. And it's blue because of the 70% of the surface that's covered by oceans and, of course, primarily because of the Pacific, Atlantic, Arctic and Indian Oceans. What we tend to forget, though, and the movie reminded us that nearly 80% of the Earth's population lives near oceans and 90% of all commerce internationally crosses the seas. So the oceans are part of every one of our lives. And frankly, this focus on the oceans is very appropriate. It's the last great frontier, I would believe, of discoveries on Earth. And very exciting to learn new things for us from that investigation, which is a first European partnership of this type for NASA with ESA. And we couldn't be more excited. So I'm so glad that this new satellite, the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich, will go into space and really teach us about this, um, you know, blue marble, our home, the most beautiful planet we know about. It te can teach us about climate change, about weather, and continue that 30-year record that was accomplished by an international community, just how the oceans are global, so is the community that needs to study it. And so with this spacecraft and with Sentinel-6B that will be launched in five years, we will add another 10 years to this amazing record of international collaboration and impact. We work together as an international community, and we do so because together we learn best. We have one science community on Earth, our international community, and also together we can provide best the information to all decision makers about critical decisions they need to make in the future. I want to tell you, I'm so honored uh, to be uh, to uh, be uh, have been part of a ceremony earlier this year to name this satellite after Dr. Michael Freilich. Uh, frankly, you know, Mike is no longer with us, unfortunately, but we will never forget his deep knowledge how forthright he was, how strong and focused on always doing the right thing. And then, once that's decided, is on doing things absolutely the right way. Mike taught all of us. I consider myself a friend of his. And I'm just so glad to know that this trust that we have and had in Mike's work was also a trust that was shared all around the community. That trust uh, and the, his understanding of the importance of that international partnership at the basis of Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich, led to this unprecedented honor uh, of his name being on the spacecraft today and up there on the launch uh, vehicle. You saw the fairing with his name on it. And I just want to tell you, I'm still moved just uh, thinking how I felt when I received that email from our friend Josef Aschbacher, uh, co-signed with multiple from uh, multiple colleagues from uh, Europe now on, the, on this call that proposed uh, renaming uh, this in, in Mike's honor. And uh, I'm just so glad to be here with our European uh, colleagues, all of them. And I'm glad uh, to turn it over to Mr. Pierre Lasso, the Deputy Director General of the European Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. 
You know, we all live in a difficult time because of the, the COVID-19 situation, which affects uh, the U.S. like Europe and the rest of the world. And so in this difficult context, I, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor, an honor to see actually that we are able to have a good cooperation between us and to develop projects like the Sentinel-6 that we are going, uh, going to launch very soon. And that's important because we have been able to achieve this between partners across the Atlantic, with NASA, NOAA, but also on this side of the Atlantic with ESA and EMETSAT, and of course, let's not forget the industry. This is a perfect example of cooperation between European and between American to achieve a very important goal. Now, as Thomas has said, I would like maybe to focus a bit on the name uh, that we, have, uh, we are going to give to this uh, uh, Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich. As he said, Mike was a great man, and I believe it's important for us to have named this satellite uh, with the name of Mike Freilich, because it's a, sign, it's a sign not only of the fact that Mike was a great man, but also it's a gesture towards the cooperation which exists between the U.S. and uh, Europe in the field of space. And I believe that's important that, you know, for a very long time, this satellite will move around the, the Earth with such a name which represents uh, so well this, uh, this achievement. Now, as you say, this is Sentinel-6 will be part of Copernicus. Copernicus is a European, European Union program, which is a nurse observation program, which of course observes on a worldwide basis. You know, I'm very proud to say that Copernicus is a real European success. It has been built under the leadership of the Commission, but of course, with a real partnership from ESA and EMETSAT, and of course, the European industry. Sometimes, you know, Europe is being criticized for not being able to work together, but Copernicus is an excellent example of cooperation and work between everybody in Europe to achieve a system which is excellent and provide a lot of information. The second message I would like to give about Copernicus is the fact that Copernicus is a global program. Of course, it's run by Europeans, but the purpose of Copernicus is to serve the whole world, the whole planet. And we really want that data which are available, which are given by Copernicus, are available for everybody across the world. And we don't hesitate when it's needed, actually, to provide it even to the U.S. For instance, we have done it uh, during the hurricane se season. Because, again, we believe that it's a powerful tool, and everybody should be able to benefit from this powerful tool. Third element I would like to say about Copernicus is the fact that, for us, Copernicus is a very important element in monitoring the situation of the Earth and more precisely to achieve what we call in Europe the Green Deal. We cannot ignore that our planet is changing. You know, I live in Brussels. I can tell you the weather in Brussels is no longer the same that it was uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It's completely different. We have almost hurricanes during the day. You know, we have uh, uh, hot summer. So climate is changing. Nobody can deny it. And from that point of view, we need to understand why the climate is changing, what are the factors, and we need also to monitor this situation. And I would say that Copernicus, one of the key roles of Copernicus is to be able to do such a thing, to help us to understand better the challenges in front of us, to better monitor the situation of our planet, and to see what we need, of course, and that could lead to what we need to do to avoid environmental degradation. So Copernicus is a powerful tool. I'm very proud to be in charge of, uh, of this tool, again, with the cooperation of my colleagues from uh, ISA and uh, uh, MEDSAT. And we really want this tool to continue and to be a basis for the cooperation, again, in the future with NASA, with NOAA, and, of course, with uh, U.S. Geological Survey. Again, as I say, this is not a tool for Europe. This is a tool for all of us, because at the end of the day, our planet is not only a European planet, it's a global planet for everybody, and we need to preserve it. Now, I would like maybe to say a few words about Sentinel-6, not too much because you already have explained a bit what, uh, you know, what is supposed to be achieved with Sentinel-6. Uh, it's a very important element in the Copernicus systems, and Josef, who will talk after me, will, will go into the details. Clearly, Sentinel-6 is designed to act for the next decade as a reference mission in altimetry. As you say, monitoring uh, the situation of the ocean, ocean, ocean is fundamental. Is a key element for everybody because, as you say, Thomas, we are surrounded by water everywhere. So it's important that we have a powerful instrument which will be able to monitor this dimension of our planet. And again, we believe that this uh, instrument, Sentinel Things, will be able to provide us um, uh, data, useful data, which could be incorporated in models 
and combining Earth and atmosphere observation will be able also to use it for uh, seasonal weather forecasting. And we believe this is extremely important because of the different elements I've already mentioned. But again, my colleagues from ESA, NASA, and UMESAT will talk much better than I could do about this. But again, the message is clear. We believe that Sentinel-6 will be a powerful tool in helping us to better understand the situation of us, of our planet. Now, as a conclusion, again, I would like to thank all partners to, to, be, able, to be able to achieve such a great program, to make sure that the launch will be on time, and honestly, as I say, to coming back to my first point, it was not certainly not obvious in the context uh, of the COVID-19 situation, which has affected everybody. So again, I would like to thank everybody for the efforts which have been done to achieve this. And again, we, by working together, we give a strong signal to the rest of the world. And now I would like to give the floor to Joseph Ashbacher from ESA, our strong partner in this enterprise. So thank you, Pierre, and uh, welcome also from my side. So thank you for this uh, introduction and also the, the words of explaining how the Copernicus uh, Corporation is working across the Atlantic. And I really would like to say that uh, for, uh, many would claim that uh, Copernicus is an excellent corporation where Europe works extremely well together in space. Yes, that is absolutely true. But in this case, it is also a, a symbol for the excellent cooperation between Europe and uh, the United States of America. And I think this is really uh, showing, and as it was mentioned also before, how powerful and how wonderful this satellite is to add to, uh, to prove uh, this, uh, this uh, cooperation. So what you see here in this slide is um, taking the pulse of our planet, uh, which is really the slogan which we are using in uh, Earth observation in ESA, where different uh, satellite sensors are measuring different parameters of our planet, of the atmosphere, of the oceans, of the land surface, of the cryosphere, but in particular to understand how these elements work together, how they are interconnected, and certainly uh, in order to better understand our planet as, as a planet, but also uh, the life uh, on our planet and how we can protect it in the best possible way. If we go to the next uh, slide, uh, it shows uh, the portfolio of Earth observation satellites, which we are currently uh, developing uh, in Europe uh, through the European Space Agency. Uh, Copernicus, uh, you see here on this uh, picture in the middle, which is the orbit with uh, the most crowded uh, uh, space of uh, satellites. Uh, Michael Freilich, uh, Sentinel-6, is somewhere in the middle. Copernicus is led by the European Commission, as uh, Pierre was uh, just uh, explaining. And the European Commission really defines the policy priorities, uh, the user requirements, but also uh, gives the majority of the funding and the leadership overall of Copernicus. And I'm very happy to see a very strong leadership of uh, Copernicus by the European Commission, uh, which is really essential to have the program uh, in place. Then you see on the right-hand side our uh, partner, UMETSAT. Uh, with UMETSAT, we have a long-standing, several decade-long cooperation on meteorological satellites. Uh, geostationary and polar orbiting satellites, and uh, Alain Ratier, the Director General of UMITSAT, uh, for sure will later on explain the context of Central 6 and the meteorological, meteorological measurements. Uh, but here, just to say that also on our side, with ESA, I'm very happy uh, to see and very happy to state that the cooperation with UMITSAT is, is actually, in one word, excellent. Then on the left-hand side, you see science. Science missions are the uh, satellites that are uh, answer to burning questions of science, but with the latest technology, uh, and really uh, novelties uh, in terms of uh, satellites that are being uh, developed uh, to address uh, uh, questions uh, that are uh, leading to a better understanding of our planet. We call them Earth Explorer missions, uh, and there are several in orbit already, and others are being uh, developed uh, and being ready, made ready for launch in the near future. All together, today we have a, a portfolio of 40 satellites uh, under development, 15 in operation and another 13 in preparation. And this is by far the biggest portfolio which in Europe we ever had. On top of this, uh, we also have uh, uh, satellites uh, missions from our member states which complement the European portfolio. And I think this is important that this is a contribution that Europe collectively provides to a better understanding of our planet. And the next slide uh, shows a bit uh, the Sentinel uh, series of satellites. You see on the right-hand side different uh, numbers, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, uh, all the way down to Sentinel-6, and they're having, having different uh, instruments on board, a radar instrument, uh, 
multispectral imager, an altimeter, atmospheric chemistry instruments, and as you see here at the bottom, Sentinel-6 with a very precise altimeter to measure sea level across uh, the oceans. And these satellites, today there are seven of those in, in orbit, they are producing at the moment 250 terabytes of data which we are disseminating uh, to the world, uh, to all the partners who want to retrieve this data. And I should say that these 250 terabytes of data which are coming out of our servers uh, here in Frascati is only the tip of the iceberg because thanks to a free and open data policy, anyone can re-disseminate this data and there are many mirror sites across the globe which are re replicating and re-disseminating uh, this data. So these data are really entering all levels of society, at the institutional level, at the commercial level, uh, they're really finding a very deep way into the various segments of our, a better understanding uh, of our planet. The next uh, slide shows uh, one, of these of, uh, one of these examples where these data are being used. Obviously today we talk about Central 6 Michael Freilich, uh, that means altimetry. Uh, you see here the measurements of uh, uh, global mean sea level uh, across, uh, the, uh, uh, across the oceans from 1993 onwards. In fact, the first measurements uh, date back to 1991 with Topex Poseidon and the RS-1, uh, both uh, uh, satellites that have been put together by Europe and, and the US. And all the way over these decades, different satellites have provided a piece of this curve for these measurements in order to be sure that we do well understand the sea level rise globally, uh, but also uh, the variations uh, on different places on our planet. What you see here, uh, of course, is also alarming. On the left-hand side of this curve, to in the 90s, uh, the sea level rise is uh, 3.1 millimeters per year, and towards the right-hand side in the 2000-2010 uh, years, uh, you see uh, uh, an increase of 4.8 millimeters per year. Uh, and this is not a linear increase, but uh, an asymptotic increase, and this, uh, of course, is very uh, alarming because this means that the sea level rise is accelerating over time. Uh, scientists are expecting that by the end of this century, uh, the sea level will have risen by about 1.3, 1.5 meters, depending a bit on uh, the models and the uh, different assumptions. But in other words, we do need these satellites to make these precise measurements and to well understand what is the impact on our planet. If we go to the next slide, uh, you see a picture of uh, Copernicus Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite, and this is really a small miracle and a fantastic uh, satellite uh, which uh, we have built uh, together. And together means really the United States, and I should really acknowledge the uh, enormous effort the United States were making both on the side of NASA, but also on the side of NOAA, in order to make this satellite a reality. And of course, on the European side, with the European Commission leading Copernicus overall, uh, with UMELSAT, with CNES, uh, and also with our uh, own organization, European Space Agency, uh, who has been essential in putting this uh, satellite uh, in, into place. Uh, as you know, the satellite will launch uh, in less than a month's time. In fact, uh, today's event uh, is called L-30, uh, indicating that it's one month before the launch date. And as you will notice, today is not uh, is the 16th of October, but the launch is planned for the 10th of November, meaning that we have actually uh, put the launch earlier than originally planned. A year ago, we had a, a plan for the launch around 15 or 16 November. So this also shows that the satellite has been on time uh, and uh, on times not only since a year, but since a few years. We have been indicated a November 2020 launch date a uh, few years ago already, and we have kept this launch date to the day. In fact, we have advanced the launch date by five days. And I think this is also proof of the engineering capability, but also the excellence of industry and project management who have all worked together to make this happen. The satellite itself uh, weighs about 1,400 kilos, has a nominal lifetime of 5.5 years, flies at an orbit of uh, 1,366 kilometers with an inclination of uh, 66 degrees, and has a, as a main instrument Poseidon 4, uh, the radar altimeter, which is a very, very precise uh, altimeter in space, plus the AMC radiometer provided by NASA, the GNSS POD provided by NASA, and the DORIS provided by CNES. The next slide will go a step uh, further and show a bit the U.S.-European uh, cooperation which we have since many, many years. And this really is uh, showing just a few acronyms and they may not be easily understandable. IMBI stands for uh, Mass Balance Experiment which we carried out together with uh, U.S. and European scientists to really study the mass balance of uh, Greenland and of Antarctica 
uh, with all the sensors and all the measurements we could take to, to determine the truth of uh, how much is melting or how much is uh, accumulating in on certain areas. And this was a fantastic work over a couple of years where the best scientists uh, on both sides of the Atlantic have been putting together data models to have a better understanding. But you also see JPPG, which is a joint program planning group uh, between NASA and ESA, where we work on different domains. And in fact, in, in one word, this cooperation which we have built up through uh, Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich, is such a wonderful cooperation, and I really would like to thank my partners in, in NASA, who have been so committed to make this happen, that we have decided that we want to further explore this cooperation on new missions, and you see a few acronyms here on few candidates which we are studying right now, where ESA, NASA, but Europe and the US in general can work closer together. And I think this is really a testimony of the strong cooperation which we have and the strong partnership with which we have developed over time. And the next slide really shows the man who has to be honored today, Michael Freilich. Michael Freilich, also as uh, Thomas was already saying, has been an incredibly strong scientist, a very strong believer in the truth. He has always told what he thinks, but he has been a brilliant scientist and uh, really uh, a, a good friend and a good partner in many aspects. You see here, we have uh, handed over the certificate to name the satellite after him. Very, very unfortunate that he cannot push the button at the launch pad uh, next month uh, to see the satellite flying into space. Uh, it makes me really feel sentimental when I think of it, but Michael Feilich was a friend, was a partner, but he also left a big legacy of international cooperation, and I really would like to thank the U.S. Uh, for having allowed this cooperation to materialize, which Mike was putting in place. And let me show the next slide, uh, which is uh, just a, a slide to thank all the partners involved in this cooperation in the U.S., in Europe. This has been a unique experience, and I'm so grateful to everyone for their contribution. And I would like to thank you from my side and hand over to my dear friend and uh, colleague in NASA, Karen St. Germain, uh, the director of NASA's uh, Earth Science Division. Thank you so much, Joseph. It's a thrill for me to be here today, still new in my role as the NASA Earth Science Director and sitting a month out from the launch of the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite. The Earth is a, is a global system of intricate and dynamic uh, interactions between ocean, land, uh, ice, and the atmosphere, and also human communities. And that global system is changing. And increasingly, decision makers in the public, in the public sector and the private sector at, at all levels are turning to the earth science community to understand those changes, to inform, frankly, both the risks and the opportunities about which they have to make critical decisions. We, uh, we in the earth science community seek to advance our understanding and, mo and ability to model and predict that Earth system. And it's the observations, and, and in particular from satellites, that underpin our ability to do that. NASA has a fleet of, uh, of satellites that observe all aspects on different time scales and different spatial resolutions of the Earth system. And Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich will be the newest addition to that fleet. Uh, as, you've, as, as Joseph explained, this satellite will continue the decades-long uh, record of observations of sea surface height. But it's, it's when we use the observations from the altimeters in combination with our other satellites that we really unleash the power of these observations. For example, when we combine the altimeter observations with gravity measurements, we can actually sort out where the, where the uh, increase in the sea level is coming from, how much of it is attributable to melt of ice sheets and glaciers, and how much of it is attributable to the expansion of the ocean itself as it warms up. When we, combine al when we combine altimetry with synthetic aperture radar, we can make better, uh, we, we have a better understanding of the relative sea level rise in our coastal communities because we can take account of what the land surface itself is doing. And when we combine altimetry with the observations we get from weather satellites, 
We can do things like better predict rapid intensification of hurricanes. When a column of, of seawater warms, it expands, and that creates a bulge on the surface that we can see with the altimeters. And when hurricanes pass over these warm bulges, that's when we, we get rapid intensification events like we saw with Hurricane Michael in 2018, and we are seeing them play out again in the hurricane season that's still ongoing this year. And we do all of this, as you've heard, through international partnerships, not just to, to uh, maintain the continuity of observations, but also to advance them. And you'll hear more about all of that when our program scientist, Nadia, speaks in just a few moments. This mission, Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich, is especially meaningful to me for two reasons. One, it was back in 1992 that as a graduate student, I got to make a small contribution to the calibration and validation of the very first, the, the Topex uh, Poseidon altimeter. But more importantly, this mission is bears the name of my friend, colleague, mentor, and my predecessor as the director of Earth Science, Michael Freilich. Michael was a, a driving force in establishing and maintaining the partnerships that enable all of the Earth Science work we do today. So with that, I'm looking forward to the launch in a month, and I will turn it over to my friend, the Director General of UMETSAT, Alain Rautier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, yes, so uh, UMETSAT and NOAA have been involved in the JSON success story since 12 years now, starting with JSON 2. And uh, the involvement of both operational agencies acknowledges the operational maturity of ocean altimetry and its unique value for ocean prediction and monitoring of mean sea level. Ocean prediction is essential as such for our blue economy, but it's also a key component of coupled ocean atmosphere prediction. And thanks to this data, so this coupled model, uh, we can uh, predict that the current hurricane season is exceptional in the Atlantic. So uh, with Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich will continue a unique climate record, an undisputed climate record, repeating exactly the same orbit as Topex Poseidon and the previous JSON mission. We will also deliver the most accurate measurements of sea surface height, against which other altimeter missions will cross-calibrate. On this slide, uh, you see that Sentinel-6 is part of a broader constellation, including also two Sentinel Copernicus Sentinel-3 satellites flying on different complementary orbits. On this picture, you can see in white the altimeter ground track of the Sentinel-6, and in blue uh, the ground track of one Sentinel-3 uh, satellite. And what you can see, uh, in fact, the uh, ground track of Sentinel-6 have a broader separation, but they repeat much more frequently every 10 days. And this is optimum for monitoring the tropical ocean, uh, where uh, changes are faster at larger scale in direct response to the change of the wind field. And this is where El Niño starts. So El Niño is, as you know, one of the major climate uh, features having impact on our planet. Next slide, please. So the role of UMETSAT has significantly expanded from JSON to Sentinel-6. Uh, uh, we uh, coordinate the system activities across the partners, and we also develop the core ground segments under our own program. And on this picture, you can see our staff uh, in Darmstadt during uh, satellite validation tests. So we are our ground segment talks with the satellites, and uh, you see two pictures because in the COVID-19 times, we had to split the team in two for social distancing, but uh, as the uh, previous speaker said, we all made the required effort to keep ready for the launch. Next slide, please. 
Uh, we're also uh, preparing ourselves to take over flight operations from the uh, Sentinel-6 Michael Feilich satellite three, uh, three days after the launch from ESA. Uh, and we will then operate the full system in cooperation with our European uh, and uh, US partners. And what you can see here is our new mission control center, the Copernicus mission control center, from which we will operate both Sentinel-3 and Sentinel-6. So I wish to thank all our partners from Europe, from the US, for their trust and also for the excellent cooperation. And uh, as Michael Feilich said, go Sentinel-6. And I'm now very pleased to pass over to uh, my friend, Dr. Parag Vaze, who I think, like me, has been involved since Top Exposite in the full series of missions, and I certainly a lot of things to tell you. Parag, you have the floor. Thank you. So my name is Parag Vaze, and I'm really honored and privileged uh, to be able to work on this incredible mission uh, called Sentinel-6. It's a, a global partnership, a, as you've heard, and uh, we are working very, very closely together uh, to uh, make this mission a reality. Measuring the world's vast oceans is a difficult problem. Uh, we have to cover a vast amount of space and to do it very, very quickly and measure the world's oceans very accurately. So naturally, satellite technology is a, a very good solution for this problem. But as I think about it, uh, having a satellite that's uh, orbiting 800 miles up, spinning around the Earth at five miles every second, and now being able to do a very accurate measurement of the sea surface height to within just two inches uh, is an incredible feat. And uh, one that uh, if you'd asked me years ago, I would have said people are crazy. But this is exactly what uh, all of our teams have been doing for the past 28 years with the start of the Topex Poseidon satellite and subsequent, subsequent JASON series of missions. And now with the Sentinel-6 project, we're planning on continuing that for the next decade and in some respects even doing it better. So let me show you an animation that describes a bit about the satellite. The satellite is provided uh, by ESA with contributions from NASA and is built by Airbus in Friedrichshafen, Germany. The Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite is built to operate for at least five years, <clears throat> five and a half years, and has a twin that's expected to launch in 2025 to really be able to extend this for the next decade. The altimeter that's provided by ESA measures the sea surface height by sending microwave pulses down to the ocean and measuring how long it takes to reflect that pulse. You can see that in this animation with the red signal that's bouncing off the ocean. However, as the signal travels through the atmosphere, it slows. So we have a NASA provided microwave radiometer instrument shown with the blue beam that measures the delay to improve the height accuracy. We also need to know precisely where the satellite is. So we have instruments from ESA and NASA that use GPS and other tracking systems to know precisely where the satellite is located. The satellite is running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doing ground track measurements of about 30 kilometers each. But over the span of 10 days, uh, we're able to build a map of the complete uh, world's oceans. So if you can go to the next animation. But as a bonus on this satellite, uh, NASA is providing a radio occultation measurement instrument that provides measurements of the Earth's atmospheric temperature uh, and humidity profiles. This is a very important measurement for the world's weather agencies and is done by measuring how signals uh, from existing satellites, like GPS satellites, are bending as they cross across the Earth's atmosphere. Now for Sentinel-6, uh, we have a few additional features uh, that we are enhancing. Sea level, as said before, is rising, but it is also accelerating, and understanding this acceleration is even more important for the future. And having very precise and stable measurements is key. So the new NASA radiometers and ESA altimeter have enhancements that improve that stability, accuracy, and resolution. 
if you can go to the next slide. The altimeters and radiometers feature higher resolution to get much closer to the coast, as illustrated by these red hash marks, which we haven't been able to see before with these types of measurements uh, from our existing satellites. As you know, uh, a vast majority, hundreds of millions of people across the world live on these very, very close coastal regions and who are directly affected by the sea level rise. So doing so, this is a global problem and a global challenge, and we're bringing together a global solution. As you've heard, we are bringing together engineers, scientists, and agencies from across the world to collaborate on this important mission. And we're doing this very actively uh, and uh, in a very successful manner. We are really uh, indebted to Michael Freilich, Dr. Michael Freilich. Uh, this was an important theme that he has stressed on all of the people that he has been working with for many generations, I being one of them to have been lucky enough to have worked with him for many years over these past missions. Uh, Dr. Freilich, we're building this satellite in your honor and implementing it in that spirit of collaboration. And we're planning on doing this, of course, on this mission, but continuing that for future generations of teams working and collaborations, hopefully, uh, continuing well into the future. The satellite, mission systems, ground systems, and importantly, all of the teams across the world are ready. We've prepared for this launch, and we're uh, anticipating a fantastic launch and commissioning of the satellite and start of this important mission for the next decade. So now I'll turn this over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Nadja Vinogradova Schiffer, who will tell you much more about the program science. Thank you, Parag. Uh, and I agree with you. Uh, what seemed like a technological wonder uh, some time ago now is a mainstream instrument in modern uh, physical oceanography and climate science. Uh, it, it enabled hundreds of discoveries, and I'd just like to touch base uh, on a few of them. Um, we talked a little bit about global mean sea level rise, and uh, when my kids asked me is three millimeter a year is a lot, um, I told them that that equivalent to adding extra 300 trillion gallons of water every year. And if you put this uh, water in milk jars, that would cover the distance from Sun to Pluto and back several times. So that's, uh, that's a lot of water uh, that, uh, that expanding and creeping to our, to our land. Uh, and if you can see from, uh, from my first animation, altimeters can tell us uh, by how much and where exactly this uh, rate of sea level uh, rise uh, is. And if you can see that the, that the red spot <coughs> excuse me, shows us the this hot spots uh, on the globe that is uh, indicative of where sea level is rising faster, such as the, the east coast of the United States. Uh, so what does NASA do with, uh, with this information besides monitoring? Uh, we have uh, dedicated uh, science teams that um, untangling uh, complex physics of sea level, sort of tease out um, physical processes behind those rise, and then use this collective knowledge uh, to improve uh, projections of uh, future changes in sea level, projections that are data-driven, physics-based, um, so what can we do with altimeters uh, beyond sea level? Uh, well, it turns out uh, quite a lot. Uh, the shape of ocean topography is related to and impacted by a lot of physical processes. Um, so we, we could tell a lot of uh, physics uh, behind it. Uh, one of the example is, of course, that was already mentioned, ocean circulation. Uh, and um, on my next animation, you can see that um, ocean is a constantly moving feature, and uh, a sa satellite altimetry record could be directly related uh, to the uh, velocity uh, of the of, 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 of ocean circulation. And uh, moving water, as you can see, 
uh, transfers uh, enormous amount of properties such as uh, heat, uh, momentum, salt, uh, carbon, plastic, oil spills, nutrients. So um, an, uh, altimetry data is our key informational constraint in climate models and ocean state estimates. Uh, as well as um, operational uh, forecasts, uh, including weather prediction that Karen already mentioned. Uh, uh, in, th in the next graphic, uh, you can see an example of uh, what the surface, uh, uh, sea surface height looks like uh, uh, other than, than trends. And you can notice those uh, uh, hills and valleys or uh, higher and lower sea levels that, that tells you exactly uh, what's happening uh, inside the water column. In fact, altimetry is our only ocean surface measurements that we make that we can connect to the physics of the whole water column, and uh, which is key in predicting hurricane intensity. But going beyond um, uh, extreme events like hurricane, we can also look at uh, interannual variations such as El Nino and beyond. As we're extending our altimetry records into the fourth decade, we could look at the climate mode of variability on a spectra of frequencies. Uh, finally, my final example that, I, that I'd like to mention today is how altimetry completely revolutionized the way we looked at tides. Uh, essentially, um, altimetry solved our multi-century problem of uh, surface uh, barotropic fast-moving tides. But what was really surprising and is the recognition and detection of the uh, internal tides when the surface tides encounter a bottom topography or sloshes over a mountain. Uh, it creates the internal fluctuations that could be high in range, hundred of meters, and only a few centimeters at the surface. And as Barack said, we with our highly accurate measurements, we can detect those internal fluctuations from the surface. And those internal waves travel for uh, thousands of kilometers and uh, uh, transport a large amount of energy. They connect uh, us to a history of lunar orbits, but also tell us about the Earth climate and energy dissipation. And this is an ongoing and active area of research that Sentinel-6 data would help us to uncover more, as well as uh, problems problems to solve with a future next generation NASA altimeter mission like SWAT. So I'm going to leave you with a little teaser here today and turn to our next speaker, Tim Dunn. Thank you, Nadia. Good morning from the Kennedy Space Center. My name is Tim Dunn and I am very proud to be the launch director for the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich mission. And I'm even more honored to represent the men and women of Launch Services Program. LSP is NASA's program that acquires the launch services or the rockets for many of our agency's most critical spacecraft. So LSP has a legacy with the Jason series of these ocean topographic satellites. All the way back in 2001, we were proud to acquire a Delta II to launch that spacecraft. And about seven years later, for the OSTM mission, which became the Jason 2 spacecraft. And then just four and a half years ago, I was really thrilled to get to work with my friend Parag Vaze from JPL and launch the Jason 3 spacecraft on a Falcon 9 rocket. All three of those missions launched from Vandenberg and so our program is based here at Kennedy Space Center, and we were proud to execute a launch campaign just this past summer in the midst of this pandemic that we're in with the Mars 2020 campaign. Had a successful launch at the end of July, and now we and LSP get to take our talents on the road and head west to Vandenberg Air Force Base while still in this socially distanced environment of a pandemic go launch a beautiful rocket with an amazing spacecraft from the Central California coast. So here we are 25 days from launch. Things are going incredibly well in the launch campaign. All of the launch vehicle hardware for the Falcon 9 rocket is at Vandenberg. It's at SLIC 4. SLIC stands for Space Launch Complex. 
or the launch pad. So we're right there on Vandenberg Air Force Base, and all of the hardware is being processed in a pre-launch manner by SpaceX. It's incredible to work with SpaceX as a company. They bring together incredible talent uh, to our industry, and uh, we are just so fortunate to be able to get a ride with them on a Falcon 9 rocket. So there in the hangar at Slick 4 at Vandenberg, not only is the rocket present and undergoing pre-launch processing, but on the other end of the hangar in the payload processing facility, the PPF, is that precious cargo that the Falcon 9 will launch, the Jason, uh, the Jason 3 spacecraft, uh, the Sentinel. Six. So all is going really well. Uh, our team has begun to deploy. The core portion of our team is going to deploy out to Vandenberg within the next two weeks. We're going to all assemble there at Vandenberg. We're going to have a series of reviews. We're going to practice countdown leading up to launch. And uh, it's going to culminate in an incredible event on the 10th of November, and I want to stress that our team remains on track. All of the hardware processing for both the spacecraft and the rocket is on track to support that 10 November launch date at about 11.30 a.m. Pacific Daylight, Pacific Standard Time, excuse me, because we're going to transition our times. Uh, we're going to have a beautiful launch from the Central California coast. And that's all I have. I'd like to turn it back to Marina. Thank you so much, Tim. We are all in eager anticipation, as you can see, for that November 10th launch across the globe. We are now ready to take media questions. Remember to press star one to get put in the queue, and please direct your questions to one of the panelists. We're also taking questions through the Seeing the Seas hashtag. And remember to be patient. We do have a little bit of delay with our European partners. So our first question comes from John Amos of the BBC. Good morning, John. John, are you with us? John Amos from BBC. Yeah, I, ho I, I hope you can uh, you can hear us here in London. And my question is uh, for Nadia. Um, I've heard it said that Sentinel Six will bring such precision to measurement that it will be able to see some of the most subtle effects of the increase of greenhouse gases on the atmosphere. I'm thinking the way that it affects trade winds, and obviously that then has an effect on sea level. Can you explain that to me? Yes, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, there, there was a Sentinel-6 uh, continues the legacy of uh, high precision uh, measurements. And uh, in addition, uh, this, uh, this way around, uh, there were additional uh, improvement to the accuracy of the sea level measurements, including uh, the um, limiting uh, calibration drift uh, to keep it under one millimeter per year level. That would truly allow you to distinguish even the slightest millimeters to sub-millimeter signal in the data, such as sea level trends and, uh, and acceleration, emerging acceleration that we talked about it today. Thank you, Nadia. Next is Elizabeth Howell of Space.com. Good morning, Elizabeth. Good morning. Thanks for your time, everybody. Um, so you've already hinted at some of the um, the distinguishing features of Sentinel-6. This is probably more for Parag or Nadia in terms of the science that it can perform. You were talking about measurements at the coast. You were talking about looking at uh, the underground or underwater sort of waves. Um, what other ways, what other kind of new science do you anticipate that Sentinel-6 is going to be bringing uh, after it launches? Thank you. Nadia, do you want to take that? Uh, we anticipate, uh, first of all, this is uh, we, we are excited to have a longer 
almost four year, four decades of continuous and uninterrupted uh, climate records. Uh, climate is uh, inherently a long, uh, large-scale and long-term processes. So some uh, events uh, taking a while to unfold. Uh, so having a long and consistent uh, uh, climate records is key to our robustness uh, of understanding of those the processes that uh, happen on a on longer time scales. Uh, you mentioned uh, improved resolution uh, along the coasts and uh, in the open ocean. So we are excited to see uh, uh, how those energetic features such as mesoscale uh, 80s that shed of the currents uh, evolve and propagate and uh, change our circulation and affect our weather and climate. Thank you, Nadia. Our next question is from Stephen Clark of Space Flight Now. Good morning, Stephen. Stephen Clark, are you with us? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. My question is for Tim Dunn. I know NASA is looking at uh, a gas generator issue on the Falcon 9 as they evaluate uh, when the Crew-1 mission can launch, a uh, commercial crew mission can launch. Your mission is still scheduled for Sentinel-6 on November 10th right now. Uh, have you studied that issue? What, what have you found? Uh, have you found that it's not an issue for this particular vehicle? And, and what can you tell us in some terms of background of what the issue actually is that uh, USF. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. So two weeks ago today, there was a GPS spacecraft on the pad at Complex 40 here at KSC, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, and it experienced uh, a launch abort in the final seconds prior to launch. And that was the Falcon 9 rocket stopping itself from launch when it sensed things weren't right during the engine startup sequence. So after that anomaly occurred on the pad, the GPS spacecraft is absolutely safe and it will launch uh, successfully uh, when uh, the uh, Space Force team is ready. But the joint government community came together alongside SpaceX uh, in an investigation uh, team to look at that engine uh, issue that prevented uh, the GPS from uh, launching two weeks ago. So that team consists of uh, folks from uh, the U.S. Space Force, from our program, NASA Launch Services Program, uh, working alongside SpaceX and their engineers from Hawthorne. And I can tell you an incredible amount of uh, data has been looked at to include uh, members from our commercial crew program, which also has an upcoming Falcon 9 flight. And so that investigation is ongoing. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of testing uh, that has occurred here at the launch site on the East Coast. The engines have been taken back to McGregor, Texas, uh, which is where SpaceX does detailed engine testing and reviews. So those engines have been further tested there. And uh, it's just an amazing team that is looking at this issue. We've learned a lot. Uh, there's going to be some hardware uh, implications as we move forward, depending on uh, the engines installed on various rockets. Uh, the GPS mission obviously is affected. The NASA Crew-1 mission is affected. Uh, we on Sentinel-6, uh, we are looking at the engines that are on our first stage, Falcon 9. Uh, we are going to work through uh, what we need to do, but as of today, we have a path forward that allows us to do uh, whatever necessary rework may be required and still maintain that 10 November launch date. So uh, while it's, it's, a, it's an issue that's being addressed by multiple agencies, multiple customers, SpaceX has been incredible in working this anomaly and bringing all of us in together. And so we are looking forward to that clear path uh, that gets us to 10 November, Stephen. Thank you so much for that, Tim. Now we're going to turn to some social media questions using, using the hashtag seeing the seas. Frank on Facebook asks, where have the oceans actually risen and by how much? 
Nadia, would you like to take that? Uh, uh, yes, you've seen on one of my animations this rotating globe uh, that's showing you exactly uh, how much and where uh, the sea level is rising over the past uh, three decades. Uh, the the graphic shows that there is a lot of yellow and red regions, as you remember, uh, showing you that uh, the sea level is is rising almost all over the global oceans. And uh, I mentioned the hot spots where, uh, unfortunately, along the U.S. U.S. Eastern Coast, um, where the sea level is rising three to four times larger than the global mean average. Uh, similar hotspots we see in the in, in the Pacific Oceans and Indian Oceans. Um, so that's um, that's the that's the picture today. And with uh, with Sentinel Six, we would uh, fine tune those numbers and potentially tapping into emerging acceleration, second derivative, if you will. Thank you, Nadia. Philippe on Twitter comments, it's the little house in space. Why is the spacecraft shaped like that? So I, I can maybe comment on that uh, a little bit. So, um, you know, as, uh, as we've been discussing about uh, these series of missions, um, we always have a challenge to um, uh, continue the measurement and do it very, very precisely. And so we have a combination of using uh, heritage technologies and things uh, that are tried and true, and then augmenting those uh, with enhancements as we go through going forward. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the ESA program uh, really selected a, a very robust uh, satellite platform uh, built by Airbus. Uh, it's a, a tried and true uh, architecture uh, with a lot of heritage from the prior missions like Cryosat. Uh, so this particular um, structure and, and form factor that you see is, is built on a lot of heritage uh, that ESA and Airbus uh, have uh, utilized in prior missions. Um, of course, very much tuned uh, for our particular uh, mission uh, needing lots of stability, uh, accuracy, and pointing control. So uh, you see the structure on the outside. Uh, if you go back to other satellites like uh, GRACE, uh, which was uh, one of the NASA programs, or, or Cryosat, you'll see a lot of similarity. But uh, really what, uh, what you don't see is uh, what's really embedded uh, in all of the, the satellite with uh, the uh, technology that's specifically for uh, this particular application. Uh, but uh, that's where that particular architecture comes from, and uh, we're really proud to be able to build on, on the successes of these prior missions. Thank you, Prag. Sky Phoenix on YouTube asks, what does it take to work for NASA or ESA? Dr. Z, would you like to take that question for NASA? And possibly we could get Joseph then to answer for ESA? That's a great idea. I'm happy to talk about this. Uh, we have a series of very talented individuals that work at NASA and very diverse. Uh, many uh, people from many different backgrounds, different accents, different parts. And I really what we're looking for are people who are just like us, very committed uh, to uh, working on these important projects. Uh, frankly, this is not for everyone. You have to really look at yourself in a following sense. It takes patience and it takes a lot of teamwork. Uh, the one thing that's really important to know, even though uh, the amazing engineers and scientists that are here on there, they, we all recognize that the only way we can do a project like this together is as an integrated team that brings together all these different perspectives. Uh, we're looking at uh, most of our employees uh, at NASA have STEM degrees, as they say, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But make no mistake, we have uh, individuals with many different uh, uh, degrees. For example, some of the artwork here was done by artists. Uh, some of the writing was done by English majors and so forth and so forth. So what does it take to work at NASA? A real desire to do so and a dedication to want to work with teams that really do amazing things. But I'm interested how you would answer that, Josef. Hmm. No, thanks, uh, Thomas. Uh, I think you have said it all, so there's not much to add uh, because uh, NASA and ESA are working in a, very, in a very similar fashion and we have very similar talents. 
I think you really need uh, talented people. Uh, we have uh, the luxury of having a, a good selection of uh, being able to, to take some of the best engineers uh, which we, we have in, in Europe. Uh, ESA has, uh, as you might know, 22 member states and we are having most of uh, our people from these 22 member states. So you need talent, uh, you need a lot of dedication, a bit of craziness uh, because uh, there are things that uh, we are doing are not always in the norm but a bit outside the box. Uh, I think you have to be ready to, to do that and go a bit beyond what uh, normally you would be doing as, uh, as an engineer. Uh, and uh, a bit of luck, I should say, because um, uh, there's always opportunities coming up, but they don't come every day, and they need to be, as always, on the right place at the right time. So, but uh, ESA and NASA, in this sense, we're really like brothers and sisters, and we have a very similar workforce, uh, which I think is, is quite unique, and that's the best asset we have. Thank you, Thomas and Joseph, for that. We have Stephen Clark now up from Space Flight Now with a follow-up question. Good morning, Stephen. Thank you for taking another question. I was wondering if the uh, various partners can discuss their financial contributions to this particular mission, uh, Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich, and um, a total cost for the mission if possible. Thanks. For NASA, I'm going to start. Uh uh, it's uh, kind of the investment for both of those spacecraft is of the order of half a billion dollars. I'm going to turn it over to uh, to ESA, uh, Josef. Yeah, no, in uh, fact, uh, in the European side, it's exactly the same size in uh, euros. Uh, so we have uh, the same investment on the European side. In Europe, uh, we have uh, three main funding partners. Uh, the European Commission, the European Space Agency, and UMITSAT in different shares. They're not exactly the same amounts, uh, but uh, these three organizations have contributed on the European side. But uh, I really, I'm very happy to say that um, the U.S. contribution is uh, the same size as the European contribution. Uh, and in fact, uh, the naming of the satellite is uh, also a good balance, and I think that shows that we, we are well aligned and we work well together in a, in a very true partnership. Thank you again to Thomas and Yosef. We're going to go back to social media questions right now. Emerson on Facebook asks, what is the level of measurement accuracy of the sensors? So I, I could start and maybe Nadia can, can compliment uh, for that. So uh, for, first of all, um, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, we have a job to, to do two things. Is one is guarantee continuity. Uh, so our, our overall uh, measurement objectives are built upon the prior JSON series missions. But it's not just to take the same uh, requirements that we've been building on, but uh, our, our existing satellites like JSON 1, 2, and 3 actually have outperformed uh, their requirements in flight. So we're, we're actually uh, benefiting from their in-flight uh, performances. And so on Sentinel-6, we, we basically uh, reset the, the requirements to be uh, more in line with what we're actually seeing in flight from the prior missions. Uh, the numbers don't change dramatically because we're really talking about small numbers. So if we're talking about uh, 3.4 centimeters, we might be going down to 3 centimeters. Uh, but that is critical, as, as Nadia mentioned, when you're looking at really small features and small scales. We're, we're doing that uh, with the altimeter with improved accuracies. Uh, we're doing that with uh, uh, and extending it um, with higher resolutions in faster data turnarounds also. This is an operational mission, as has been said before. So uh, getting all of that data, accurate data, down to the ground, processed, and turned around to the community within three hours and doing that uh, basically 99% of the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, is part of that enhancement. We're also uh, trying, it, particularly on, on the NASA instrument, uh, to improve the stability. Uh, so uh, having this uh, augmentation where we can guarantee continuity on one hand, but enhance uh, the capability on the other hand for now and for the future. Uh, this sort of stability uh, measurement really took us 
months, if not years, to look at uh, collecting data, processing data, averaging data for a long time, and we're expecting to shrink that time cycle. So uh, part of the improvement always isn't in the exact accuracy, but it's also in the time scales that we're talking about and being able to turn that data around and having it more useful to the scientists faster and, and reliably. Maybe Nadja wants to, to add. Uh, thank you, Parag. Well said. Uh, perhaps I would only add that um, uh, the way we deal uh, in, in Earth science, we take multiple repeated measurements. We also average them over the same uh, time and space. Uh, so over the global mean, uh, you would get uh, those millimeter accuracies because you're averaging uh, a, a larger number of repeated observations. And Nadia, this probably will go to you as well because it's a related question. Russell on YouTube wants to know, will the satellite be sensitive enough to capture rogue waves? Rogue waves, well, they're high enough. You don't need a lot of uh, accuracy. So if you are lucky enough to catch them uh, between the 10 day uh, repeat cycle that they passes, uh, that uh, sure. And Camelia on Facebook asks, as a teenager, how can we help on this project? I'm going to start, uh, but I'm really interested in what uh, uh, Karen is going to say about that also, perhaps others as well. You know, I have to tell you, as a teenager, uh, you know, I'm a scientist and uh, I'm an astrophysicist, so I look, I tend to look away from Earth, uh, even though I live on, and I know now, on the most beautiful planet ever observed. We have thousands of those now uh, from around the, the galaxy. And, uh, you know, what we can do as teenagers are really two things. So first of all, it's like there's amazing work out there. NASA is putting out lessons, they're putting out movies, is putting out uh, books, and, and many of our partners, you know, uh, uh, in various uh, locations are really telling the story of nature. Go focus on that, be interested in that. Every once in a while, we have programs, and there are some that are focused on, on earth science and actually even on the ocean that are what we call citizen science programs. So it's really science projects that you can participate, perhaps with, with your friends or parents, to really engage and do one of those elements, and frankly, Citizen science is really powerful. We have discoveries that come from citizen science. And so, so you know, find out where those opportunities are and get involved. I have to tell you, uh, there, is, there is no uh, age that's too early to get started to do this amazing work, getting to know our planet and really actively participating in doing research. But Karen, how would you answer it? Thanks, Thomas. I would just expand a bit on, on what you said. Uh, we. We, uh, for, for decades now, NASA has been putting or, or making our data available just, you know, f to, uh, to enable, of course, scientific collaboration around the world, but also to make it available for, for citizens, for students to explore themselves. So I would, I would say yes, absolutely. Uh, NASA has a, a, a lot, uh, and, and also our European partners. We have, uh, we have websites that you can explore and, uh, and, and learn the science as, it, as we do, really. We, we write the, the stories of what we learn and post them very quickly as we're learning, so you can follow along with us. You can explore the, the data yourself. Um, as Thomas said, we have a variety of citizen science uh, activities. One of them just closed, the, the annual Space Apps Challenge, where we, we throw uh, challenges out and, and people around the globe uh, form their own teams and come up with their own uh, solutions. And then I think the last thing I would say is come join us. Uh, you know, really focusing on, on uh, STEM in your education will uh, but not exclusively, as Thomas said earlier, but focusing on your education and, and, uh, and, and coming to join us because there's so much more work to do ahead of us uh, and we're going to need the talent, the enthusiasm and, and, the, and the perspectives that you'll bring to our teams as we move forward. Thanks. 
Thank you so much, Thomas and Karen. And it is our future generation, so please apply. I'm sure everyone across the board with our European partners also have internships. So definitely make sure that uh, we impress that upon our future generation. So thank you so much for all of your questions, and thank you to our panelists for joining us today. If you want a replay of all of the graphics that we showed in today's program, that will be replayed right now until the end of the hour. The U.S. European Sentinel six Michael Freilich satellite will launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base no earlier than November 10th of 2020. For more information on this satellite, go to nasa.gov slash sentinel6. You can also follow on all social media platforms at NASA Earth to keep up with this mission and all the Earth missions we are a part of. Thanks so much for joining us today at NASA Earth Science. Your home is our mission. Thank you for watching. This is this big, complex machine that we're trying to understand. We really need to understand how it's changing. How is it evolving? Wherever you live on this globe, the oceans will influence you in some form or the other. We are answering those really interesting and hard questions that we all have about our universe and our planet. And my name is Severin Fournier, and I'm observing our changing oceans from space. I'm Shannon Statham, and here at NASA JPL, I help prepare Sentinel-6 for its journey to space. My name is Shailen Desai. My name is Parag Baze. My name is Ben Hamilton, and I'm studying sea level rise from space. We're looking at a one-third replica of the Sentinel-6 microphylic satellite. Sentinel-6 is all about water. This sort of top half of the satellite houses the main instruments. We have the altimeter, we have the radiometer. Sentinel-6 is a collaboration with NASA, NOAA, the European Space Agency, and, and also UMITSAT in Europe to measure sea level. And it's specifically capturing the height of the ocean. The satellite is actually emitting a, a signal. And that signal is bouncing back. And it measures the time it takes for that pulse to get back. So we've been measuring the height of the ocean since the beginning of the 90s. I've worked on Topex Poseidon, Jason 1, Jason 2, Jason 3. We really need that long duration observation and Sentinel-6 is going to allow us to continue that record so that we can better predict what is the rate of change, what is it going to look like in a year, five years, ten years from now and so forth. It's not just scientific curiosity, it really impacts the daily lives of people and their ability to plan for their future. I see pictures of coastal inundation and flooding. You start to realize the importance of understanding what sea level is doing now. We can use that understanding to know what sea level might be doing in the future. Seeing that come to fruition is a personal satisfaction and an emotional satisfaction. Scientists around the world are using these data to help people. The importance of this project and where it touches is on all walks of life all across the world. From space, it's just one planet.